everyone. Today we're going to talk about probability. And this is just our first talk about it, so I'm just calling this probability introduction. We're going to start with some definitions. First, we have an experiment. An experiment is just the observation of a random phenomenon. Outcomes are any result of an experiment. The sample space would be the set of all outcomes of an experiment, and then an event is a set of outcomes of an experiment. Let's make that a little clearer by looking at a quick example. So we could have the experiment of rolling a set of dice. The outcome would be the number of dots on the dice, and then an event could be something like getting doubles. So let's try a quick experiment. Say we had a candy jar, and it had an equal number of orange, which I'm going to call O, grape, I'm going to call G, and strawberry, which I'm going to call S. So the candy jar has these candies in it, and we're going to find the sample space of selecting two at random. So when we select two, they could both be orange, they could both be grape, they could both be strawberry. Or maybe we got an orange on the first one and a grape on the second, or an orange on the first and a strawberry on the second. We could also have first selected grape and then got orange, or we could have first got grape and then got strawberry. And then lastly, we could have strawberry with orange, or could we have strawberry with grape? So when we look at this sample space, it lists every possible outcome that we could get. Just to help out as you're doing this, notice there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 outcomes. How do we get 9? So 9 is, think about, I had two things to do. I had to pick a first candy, and I had to pick a second candy. So the first time I had three choices, orange, grape, or strawberry. The second time, I had three choices, orange, grape, or strawberry. Three times three is nine. That kind of helps sometimes to know how many outcomes I'm supposed to have when you're trying to make the sample space. It's a nice little verification. So let's try again. So here's another experiment. It's saying we have a game. In this game, you only have two choices. You can win or you can lose. So there's no ties. Let's say we play the game three times. Let's list all the things that could happen, which that is our sample space. So um, we could win, right? And we're playing this game three times. So we could win, win, win. We could also win, win, lose. We could win, lose, win. Or we could lose, win, win. So notice what I'm doing is I started with all wins. And then I said, well, what if I lost one time? Well, after that, I've lost one time. What if we lose two times? So I could win, lose, lose, or I could lose, win, lose, or I could lose, lose, win. So I'm kind of moving where the W was. So it was the first, the second, or the third. So we've won twice, we've lost twice, then the last thing would be we would lose all three times. So this would be our sample space. I kind of wrote it different that time. So usually we write it in a set, and we put commas in between. So I'm just rewriting it to show you. Again, let's count. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight things that happen. Now, last time we got nine, this time we got eight. This time we had one, two, three things we were doing. We had the first game, we had the second game, and we had the third game. In each of these games, there were two choices. We could win or lose. So two times two times two, that equals eight. So there's my eight outcomes all together. Again, having that number is a really nice check to say, yep, we got them all. Now we're ready to start looking at probability. The first type of probability we're going to look at are cases where they have equally likely outcomes. So equally likely outcomes means an experiment has the same probability or the same chances that any outcome would occur. So equally likely outcomes are helpful when we're doing something called theoretical probability. Theoretical probability means we're not actually going to do the experiment, but we're going to think about what we think would happen. So. In the case of equally likely outcomes, to get the probability, we look at how many ways an event can occur divided by the number of elements in the sample space. Sometimes I write that as n 
NE. So that NE says the number of ways the event can occur, and then number S, number of things in the sample space. So that's just kind of a little shortcut for me so that I don't have to write as much. And I would actually write all of this. So the probability V would be number of elements in the event, number of elements in the sample space. We also will have empirical probability. The empirical probability of an event is the number of times an event occurred divided by the number of times the experiment was conducted. I think it's really important to say like this was conducted means we actually did the experiment. So in theoretical, we're just thinking about it. In empirical, we've recorded the data. So we have some numbers, we've seen some things happen, and that's the difference between the two. The formulas look the same, which is really helpful. It's still the number of times E occurred, but this time on the bottom, instead of number of elements in the sample space, we're really saying, oh, we did do this experiment, and we know how many times it was done. So when we're looking at what the difference is, here's a really easy one to talk about. What if we have this question? If a woman's pregnant, and assuming she's going to have one baby, what's the probability she's expecting a girl? So I think most of the time we would say, well, there are two things she could have, a boy or a girl, and a girl would be one of those two things. So this would be theoretical because we only thought about what would happen. We didn't actually do anything, right? We just thought about it. So we got this theoretical probability of a half. Empirical would say, let's look at the data. So here's data from the state of Nevada, and it says, here's the birth for a particular year. And if I believe right, this was for 2020. So looking at that, there were 1,000, looking at that, I had 17,370 female births and 18,312 male births. So we look at the probability of a girl now doing this empirically is 17,370 over 35,682. I'm going to put that in my calculator and I'm going to write this as a decimal. So it's 0.4868 or if you wanted to write it as a percent it would be 48.68 percent. So we can see a slight difference between theoretical, which was 50 percent, and empirical, which is 48.68 percent. Regardless of what we're looking at, if we're looking at empirical or if we're looking at theoretical, we have a few rules that probability always follows. First, the probability of an event that doesn't occur is zero. The probability of an event from a sample space will occur is 1. The probability of an event is always greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1, and then the sum of all the probabilities in the sample space is 1. An event may consist of one outcome, or it can have more than one outcome. An event with no possible outcomes is called an impossible event, and its probability will be 0. An event with only one outcome is called a simple event, an event whose probability is 1 is called a certain event. We know it's going to happen. Again, let's try some examples. So look at the spinner. It has the numbers 1 through 6, and each of them have a color on them. 1 is red, 2 is yellow, 3 is green, 4 is orange, 5 is blue, and 6 is purple. Let's find the probability of spinning the spinner and landing on a 3. So we're definitely doing theoretical here. We're not actually going to spin the spinner. but all of the pieces of the spinner are equally likely. They have the same size. So when I look at the probability of getting a 3, I say, well, how many ways could I get a 3? Just one way. And how many things were possible? What's in our sample space? Six things. So my probability is 1 over 6. You want to pay attention to when you answer homework, when you answer quizzes or assignments, always look at do they ask the answer to be written as a fraction in reduced form? Do they ask for you to give a decimal or do they ask for a percent? For this particular one, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it as a fraction. The second question on the page says, let's find the probability of getting a result less than 5. Notice it's not less than or equal to, it is strictly less than 5. So less than 5 would be 1, 2, 3, or 4. So this is 4 out of 6, but remember, you want to reduce that to 2 over 3. Let's continue with the spinner and let's find the probability of getting a 4. Well, getting a 4 was just like getting a 3. There's one way to get a 4 out of 6 possible things. Now I said, let's find the probability of getting a number greater than 6. 
Well, the numbers stop at 6, so the probability of getting a number greater than 6 is 0. This is that impossible event we talked about. Okay, C says let's find the probability of getting an odd number. Well, when we look at the odds, it's 1, 3, and 5, so there are 3 of them. Out of the 6 outcomes, I can reduce that to 1 over 2. D says, find the probability that we get a number less than 10. Since all of our numbers are less than 10, we have six ways to do that, divided by the six possible choices in the sample space. Six over six is one. This is what we call a certain event. E says, probability that we get a red or a blue. So one is red, five is blue, so we have two out of six, which again reduces to one over three. Okay. In our next example, it says in the picture, there are two green, three yellow, one blue, one pink, one purple, and one red jelly bean. We're going to fill in the chart with the probability of selecting a jelly bean at random. So the idea is we're going to pick one, and we're going to look for probabilities. I'm going to leave this one in fractions. Before I start, we would have to know how many jelly beans do we have all together. So we have two plus three plus one plus one plus one plus one, right? So I have one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine. You could also count the picture. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine is my denominator. That's my sample space. The first one says green. So we had two green out of the nine choices. Yellow, there were three out of nine. And I'm going to write over to the side that that reduces to one third. Red, there was one red, so that's one over nine. Blue, there was one blue, one over nine. Pink, one over nine. And then purple, also one over nine. This is a good place to show that this adds up to one. So here, what did I write? This is my sample space. I could get green, yellow, red, blue, pink, or purple. If you add up two over nine, three over nine, one over nine, one over nine, one over nine, one over nine, that's two, three, one, one, and one one and one, that's nine over nine, which is one. So this goes with our other rule that says everything that we get in the sample space is going to have a probability from zero to one, and then when I add them up, it's going to total into one. So this rule for one is for the sample space, it's not for events. Events is like picking other stuff. There can be duplicity when we're doing that. So this is just the sample space adds up to one. So here's another chart, and this says the chart gives the grade distribution for a class. So the grades A, B, C, D, F given, and then this other part is the frequency. 30 students got an A, 18 students got a B, 15 students got a C, 9 students got a D, and 18 students got an F. So this is looking at empirical. Right, so we have some data that we're doing, and we're going to, if we were to select a student at random from this group, what's the probability that student made an, made an A? So the probability is there are 30 students who made an A, and we first need to know the total. So if we add 30, 18, 15, 9, and 18, this gives me a total of 90. So my probability of A is 30 over 90. We could reduce that to 1 over 3. And this time, let's do some decimals. So I'm going to put that as two decimal places as 0.33. Part B says probability of not getting an A. So not getting an A would be a B, C, D, or F. So you could add 18, 15, 9, and 18. Or you could say it's everybody but the 30, which means it would be 60 over 90 which is 2 over 3, which we could reduce to 0.67. Notice if we add 0.33 and 0.67, that adds up to 1. Everyone in the class either got an A or didn't get an A. Same thing's going to happen here when I look at an F. So the probability a student got an F was 18 over 90. Well, I can divide top and bottom by 9. I get 2 over 9. This is 0.22. Then not an F would be everybody else. If I do 90 minus 18, I get 72 over 90. This reduces to 8 over 9. 
this is going to give me 0.89. Now this, when I add 0.22 and 0.89, actually comes down to 1.01. .01. That's because we round it. So really, this looks like 0.22, and it goes on forever. This looks like 0.88, and it's going on forever. And it's that rounding, which may should come up just a little bit too high. But that's OK. You would still put in 0.22 and 0.89. So what we did is really an example of something called the complement rule. Anytime we have something that we're trying to do the opposite of, so we're going to say not E. Not E is referred to as the complement of E. We can write this not E by putting like a little dash over by the E. So instead of E, I write E complement. What happens is when I add them together, the probability of E prob the probability of E plus the probability of E complement, it's going to add up to 1. Right? It's kind of like the A. Either you get an A or you don't. You get an F or you don't. I can rearrange this equation and solve for E complement. So I would have the probability of E complement is 1 minus the probability of E. Sometimes that makes our life easier. It gives us a little shortcut. So we'll use that when it is convenient. So let's try another example. This time we're going to pick one card from a standard 52 card deck. The first thing we're going to talk about is finding the probability of a king. Well, there are four kings in the deck, one for each suit. So there's a heart, a diamond, a club, and a spade. So there are four out of the 52. Well, let's leave it as a fraction. We're going to write 1 over 13. Then we would say, what's the probability of not getting a king? We could do 1 minus 1 over 13. Well, 1 minus 1 over 13 is 12 over 13. If you don't like fractions and you don't want to have to worry about how to do it, remember, you could put this in your calculator. So watch that in Desmos, I can do 1 minus 1 over 13. And it first gives me a decimal, but then there's this box over box that looks like a fraction. When I click that, it'll say 12 over 13. So even if you don't like fractions, you're going to be OK. Since we're here, let's just look at that 4 over 52 we talked about. And again, see how it came in as a decimal, but I can click it back over and it will do a fraction. So use Desmos, make things easier for yourself, and you can quickly convert between decimals and fractions. Part C says find the probability of getting a club. Well, a club has 13 cards. It starts at an ace, it goes 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 10, then jack, queen, king. That gives you a total of 13 out of 52, which is 1 over 4. Or you could have started with, there are four suits, so I have a 1 in 4 chance of pulling a club. Then the probability of not getting a club is going to be 1 minus 1 over 4, which is 3 over 4. So really nice use of the complement rule here. Let's look at another chart. This time a group of students was polled about their majors. The results are given in the table. Use the information to find the probabilities. So notice we had 45 business majors, 15 nursing majors, 20 engineering majors, 50 liberal arts majors, 35 other majors, which gave us a total of 165 students. So if we're picking a student at random, the probability that student would be a business major would be 45 over 165. So I'm going to call that 0.27. Then the next question says, not liberal arts. Well, there are 50 liberal arts students, which means everybody else is not liberal arts. So I'm going to say that's 165 minus 50 over 165. So 165 minus 50 is 115 over 165. This gives me 0.6969, and it repeats. So when I round it to two decimal places, it'll be 0 0.70. Sticking with this table, now let's find the probability the student is engineering. So engineering, there are 20 engineering out of the 165. That gives me 0 0.12 repeating, so that's 0 0.12. And then I said nursing or other. So nursing or other says we're going to add that together. So I have 15 plus 35 over 165. That's 50 over 165, which is 0 0.30. For this problem, we have a chart about the number of dogs owned. We had 320 people that don't have a dog, 125 that have one dog, 40 people have two, and 15 people have three or more. So in this survey, 500 per people revealed the number of dogs they owned. If we select a person at random, let's find the probability the person does not have a dog. So remember, we said there was a total of 500 people. 
and we're saying if they don't have a dog, that's 320 over 500. That could be reduced. You can use your calculator or you can do it by hand. It reduces to 16 over 25, or if you want to write it as a decimal, let's call it 0.64. Let's find the probability that the person has exactly one dog. So exactly one dog is 125 over 500. That could be reduced to 1 over 4, or as a decimal, 0.25. C says find the probability the person has less than three dogs. What they're not going to have is three or more. So the quickest way to do that would say, well, 500 minus 15 is 485. So 485 people have less than three. And then I can divide that by 500. Again, let's write that as a fraction. So reducing, it comes to 97 over 100, which is 0.97. Here's another chart. The chart's kind of a little bit bigger. It has multiple columns. So the columns break down the Golden Knights by their age and citizenship, and this was from the team in the fall of 2019. So for Canadians, there were two Canadians less than 24, eight Canadians that were 24 to 29, and five Canadians that were 30 or over. There was one U.S team player that was less than 24, two from the U.S. that were 24 to 29, and one that was 30 or over, and then other. So saying what other team were, the other is from another country, not Canada, not U.S. So there were no team players that were less than 24. There were two from 24 to 29 that were from another country that wasn't Canada or the U.S., and then none that were 30 and over. So Let's do some small summaries first. In total, 2 plus 1 plus 0, we had 3 players less than 24. We had 8, 2, and 2, which is 12 players that were 24 to 29, and 6 players that were 30 and over. Going across 2, 8, and 5, that says 15 total Canadians. 1, 2, 1 is 4 players from the United States and 2 from somewhere else. Then if you add that up, 15, 4, and 2, that is a total of 21. You can double check yourself by adding 3, 12, and 6, also 21. So 21 players that we're talking about. So 30 and over. So looking at the 30, we had 6 players out of the 21. Let's write that as a fraction, and let's call that divide by 3 becomes 2. Divide by 3, that's 7. The second one says find the probability the player is not a U.S. citizen. So not from the U.S., would be Canadian or other. Well, we can see there are four from the U.S., which means everybody else is somewhere else, so 21 minus 4 is 17. So our probability would be over 21, over 21, so 17 over 21, not U.S. Let's go back and look at that age-wise. So let's look at the probability the player is 24 to 29. Well, there were 12 over the 21. You can reduce that to 4 over 7. Then I have the players less than 24 or U.S. Now be careful with this word or. Let me kind of circle it on the chart. So less than 24, I have the first column. That I have 2 and I have 1 and I have 0. Or U.S. U.S. had 1, 2, 1. But you see this circle where there's one U.S team player that's less than 24, so you don't want to count that person twice, so be careful when you're adding up. So I'm going to have the 2, 1, and 0, that's 3, 4, 5, 6, so there are 6 out of the 21. Again, we could divide by 3 and make that 2 over 7, but I do warn you, be careful with the or because you can have something that's in both. Then the Next one says the player is Canadian and 24 to 29. So this is really specific. So they're Canadian and they're 24 to 29. This is 8 over 21. So you do want to make sure you slow yourself down. You read it really carefully. Pay attention to words like or and not. Those are all really important.